Thanks for taking a minute to click into a fresh word video. This is my thinking this morning as I got up early this morning. Uh, I was thinking about how to think about voting. And I came across two passages, one in 1 Corinthians 7, one in Philippians chapter 3. And I want to share them with you. And what I gleaned from them, maybe it'll be a, of help to you as you think about voting in the upcoming midterm elections, which are slated for next week. They're very vitriolic. They're very divisive. They're very sullied with untruths and with innuendo, even rank lies. Uh, but there's much at stake as well. But more than what's at stake, I wanted to know how would God through Paul and the Spirit help me think about voting? So I've read other people's articles and I've gained a lot from them and I've sort of distilled them into my own thinking. Here's just a couple passages. This just takes a few minutes. First, 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Listen to verses 29 through 31. This is what I mean, brothers. The appointed time has grown very short. Now, when I read that, I thought about studying through Revelation, and I thought, of course the time is growing very short. Uh, of course this is the time when the church is going to be giving the good news and bearing witness. All who call in the name of the Lord will be saved. That's our message now. We're proclaiming Christ and Him crucified, and we don't want to know anything else. We want to be focused on Christ and Him crucified. We want our children to be saved. We want our grandchildren and our parents and our spouses and our nieces and nephews and our friends and our co-workers and our fellow students at school as well as our enemies to turn and repent from sin and be saved. Trust in Jesus Christ alone for the forgiveness of sins which he achieved by taking our place as our substitute upon the cross. That's the message that drives us. That's why we exist. That's why I exist. That's why we are a church. That's why the church exists on the earth. That's why time itself exists. God is patiently holding back, as it were, the judgment that rightly deserves to fall upon sin in the world. And he's doing so out of patience to say, hear the good news, hear the good news, hear the good news. Paul has that in mind when he's writing to the Corinthians about how they're to get along with practical needs in the world, practical questions. You'll see that. He says, this is what I mean, brothers. The appointed time has grown very short. From now on, let those who have wives live as though they had none. And those who mourn as though they were not mourning. And those who rejoice as though they were not rejoicing. And those who buy as though they had no goods. And those who deal with the world as though they had no dealing with it. Why? He gives the answer, for. The next word is for. It shows a ground or a basis or a reason why he said these odd things. For the present form of this world is passing away. Does he mean we don't honor our spouses and care for them and live together with them in an understanding way and value them as Christ and the church? Of course he doesn't mean that. He, he upholds all of those truths that he says elsewhere. And so he's not saying don't regard your spouse with love and affection and obedience and honor. That's not at all what he's saying. What he's saying is don't make an idol out of your spouse. Don't value your spouse more than you value being with Christ. Your spouse and your marriage is temporary. It comes to end an end in this world when one of, or the other of you dies. So value Christ, who's of more worth than any possible worldly thing, including a wonderful marriage. That's why he goes on to say, uh, not only live with your wife as though you had none, but mourn as though you're not mourning. Because mourning is the grief over the loss of something in this world, a, a good morning. Not good morning like good morning, but a right kind of morning where you're mourning because you're actually sad over losing something in this world that is very, very, very precious. So mourning is a, a description of a value, and that's a good thing. We want to have mourning over the loss of values or the loss of persons or the loss of experiences. But none of those values echoed in a mourning or a sadness are more valuable than Christ. That's what he's saying. He says, those who rejoice as though they were not rejoicing. It's the same thing. If you have something wonderful, a precious value given to you and you can rejoice over it, rejoice over it, but don't rejoice over it more than you rejoice over Christ. Elsewhere, he says in Philippians, remember, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Why? Because it's more Christ. 
He says, those who buy as though they had no goods. So you buy something, you spend money for it, you give something in exchange and you have it. You have a loaf of bread or you have a bag of groceries or you have a tank of gas or you have a house or you have land or you have other goods and services and you buy those that you have a value that you received for the money you spent. But don't value what you purchase more than Christ himself. That's the point. Why? At the beginning, at the end of this little unit, he says, the appointed time has grown short, verse 29, and for the present form of this world is passing away, verse 31. Do you see? He's reorienting himself and our thinking on the heaven which is to come. He's reorienting us on glory and on the love of God and on the rewards of heaven, which are ours in Christ Jesus. He's reorienting us on what we look forward to in the life to come when we will enjoy fellowship with our brothers and sisters in Christ and fellowship with the Lord himself forever and ever and ever and every good blessing, including joy and no more mourning, including feasting and goods aplenty, all received from God, enjoyed as from him, given back to him in worship. So I then think of uh, an all um, uh, summarizing passage in Philippians chapter three. Paul says something very similar in that very famous passage where he says in Philippians, we are not citizens of the world, but we are citizens of heaven. Remember that in 320, but our citizenship is in heaven and from it we await a savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Our citizenship is in heaven. That doesn't mean we don't have an earthly citizenship. It does mean we have one, but we act as if we don't have one. In other words, we don't get excited if our candidate wins or our country is, is functioning just like we expect it to, nor do we become dejected if our candidate loses or our country isn't functioning the way we expected it to because we don't rejoice and mourn as if we're rooted in this world. We're so fixed on Christ. We're so fixed on the world to come and so uprooted from this world that we actually become useful in this world and we actually become a bold and fruitful witness in this world because our minds are so fixed on heaven, the world to come. I hope that's helpful for you. It's helpful for me. It doesn't make me want to run away from voting. It makes me want to go vote as an act of worship unto the Lord, as an act of honoring him and his values. I want to know more how Christ is, is telling me to vote than I want to know how any candidate is telling me to vote or any party or any political system or any philosophy that man can conceive. I want to know how is Christ values on display in my voting? That's the most important question because my voting is not about winning or losing or any human person or even me. It's about Christ. I hope that's helpful for you. It's fun for me to think through those things. I've been helped by so many others. I hope if that triggers thoughts in your mind about uh, glorifying Christ in your voting and in every other aspect of your life, then I'm thrilled. Let me pray with you. Father, thank you so much for the opportunity to think about these realities. We thank you that we're not under tyranny in this country and we do still have the right to vote. We thank you that the right to vote extends to men and women. And we thank you for the, that the right to vote extends to all ethnicities. And it's not limited to just one ethnicity. Thank you so much for uh, the government that we have. We pray that each one who works within the government would fear you, Lord, and obey you, uh, though we know that very few do. But for those who do, we're thankful. And we pray that you would orchestrate reality on the earth, including in the United States of America in such a way that your word and your truth are highlighted and your gospel uh, well proclaimed in the order that government produces. We know that's your aim. We know your word is plain on that. So make it so even in this coming week when we enact voting in this country. God, we thank you for your blessing over the faith family at the landing. For those who are battling with sorrow and mourning, would you Give them hope in their morning. For those who are rejoicing, we rejoice with them. And would you bless them with the knowledge of true joy in their rejoicing? Would you bless, Lord, uh, families and marriages and individual hearts to rest in you, trust in you, love and obey you? Gather us for worship for Sunday school at 9 a.m. to be fed well and, and worship together over the word and in song and in prayer at 10 a.m. Uh, we thank you so much for the many events that are going on in the life of this church and the way you're building up the faith family at the land. We don't look to ourselves or even to this world and certainly not to our country. We look to you. You are our great hope. You are our great joy. You are the great ground 
and the gravity and goal of our lives. And so we are gladly looking to you for all things in Jesus name, by his death and resurrection on our behalf. I pray all these things. Amen. Thanks for a minute to think about voting and to think about some Bible passages. God bless you. Uh, God strengthen you. God keep you and make his peace to rest upon you in these days ahead. See you soon.